Welcome to the Voices of War, a podcast with a simple vision, to bring to life the true costs of war through the voices of those who've lived it. I'm your host, Maz, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Today, my guest is Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grosman. He requires very little introduction, as I'm sure most of my audience will be intimately familiar with his books, most notably the one that has revolutionized the way we think and talk about combat. The book is, of course, On Killing, The Psychological Cost of Learning to Kill in War and Society, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, has been translated into multiple languages, is on the U.S. Marine Corps Commandant's Required Reading List, and is required reading at the FBI Academy and numerous other academies and colleges around the world. During his extensive career, Colonel Grosman taught psychology and military science at West Point. He's also a former Army Ranger who has combined his experiences to become the founder of a new field of study, which he termed killology. Through this and the energy which he brings to the subject, he has encouraged discussions around the world that have challenged the way we talk about the act of killing in war, the psychological costs of war, the ongoing increase of violent crime, and the process of healing by survivors of violence in war and peace. Throughout his time, and apart from writing On Killing, the perennial bestseller, he has published a further five non-fiction books, four novels, and even two children's books. Today, he is the director of the Killology Research Group. In the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, he has been on the road almost 300 days a year, training elite military and law enforcement organizations worldwide about the reality of combat. Colonel, I know that I've barely scratched the surface of your extensive biography, so I'll link to a more extensive version of show notes. Uh, nonetheless, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today, and welcome to the Voices of War. Thanks, man. It's my pleasure. Whoever that guy is you're talking about, he's go, go get a life, you know. Yeah. Well, well, no, I was going to say, he's done a fair bit. He's done a fair bit. Pretty good ride. <laughs> but you know, uh, uh, the whole business really began uh, when I was a young paratrooper, 82nd Airborne Division in 1974. Uh, we went on up to uh, to the rank of a uh, of, uh, buck sergeant, then went to OCS. But it, it, we had, it were the, the 82nd Airborne is our unit ready to punch out anywhere, anytime. Uh, and, and we knew we could be in combat tomorrow. And we had Vietnam veterans all around us. And we wanted to know what combat was going to be like. And, and really, they wouldn't say. It was like this taboo topic. Mm. So fast forward, you know, I went to OCS, became an officer, going to grad school, en route to teaching at West Point in the late 1980s. And, uh, and I said, well, I'll do my, you know, my graduate thesis on killing. Mm. You know, not homicide, but, but lawful killing. And the truth is that just not too many other people that have done much work on that topic. You know, it's not, it's not hard to be the leading expert in the field of one, you know. Yeah, but absolutely. We, uh, we pulled everything together. And, and here the book is in, in a nutshell. You know, uh, people point to some horrible crime said that proves that mankind is a killer I said it's an that's an outlier it's literally one in a million you know here in america it, it, the one terrible murder you hear about that, that there's one in in 330 million that you hear about well what about the 99.9 percent who will go a lifetime never killed anybody or even tried to think mm. about that you know? mm. divorce infidelity layoff traffic accidents in a lifetime of provocation Less than one in a thousand citizens will even seriously attempt to take a human life. Explain that. Hmm. So what we realized is inside the, 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 the brain of most healthy species is kind of this hardwired resistance against killing your own kind. Yeah. Uh, and animals, that makes sense as well, right? I mean, that makes absolute sense from an evolutionary standpoint, doesn't it? Yeah. If your territorial and mating battles went to, were to the death, it would be terribly counterproductive. You know that? Piranha will sink their teeth in anything that hits the water except other piranha. Mm. Rattlesnakes will wrestle each other, but they sink their fangs in anything else. Animals with antlers and horns are usually the most harmless manner. And there's some major exceptions out there, but the same thing's true of mankind. I, I had a, an article in an archaeological magazine, co-authored with a guy, a great peer-reviewed archaeological journal, uh, about how in the ancient wars, uh, uh, almost nobody got killed in the actual battle. It's the pursuit afterwards where all mm. the killing happens. Mm. And, and you look at the chariot, you know, the, the early chariot. Is, you know, uh, there's one guy with a spear take out the horse and then take out the chariot. Uh, you know, what, what, what value was there in this thing? Well, they, they didn't, they, they weren't shock troops. Mm. Uh, they, 
they stayed back and then they were the pursuit element. And the chariot, and really in combat, the average soldier just in World War II just wouldn't pull the trigger. But cruiser weapons almost always did. So if you had a machine gun with a gunner, an assistant gunner, there's just mutual accountability. So here's the chariot now with a with the, you know the 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 archer hmm. and the the driver, and you suddenly have this cruiser weapon, you have this mobility advantage, and and we looked at battle after battle, you know Alexander the Great and all of his battles supposedly never lost more than a couple hundred men to the sword because he always won, hmm. and, you know, and then we looked at the, the United States uh, invasion of Panama a little while back, taking Noriega out of control. And we said, oh, we wiped out this battalion. We killed all these guys. We killed all those guys. And then about six months later, we found out, oh, those guys are still alive. They just, they said, sought this for a game of soldiers. Uh, and they snuck off to their village and went back to life. And, and, the real, and that's the reality throughout life. We just never went back. And the king wants to say, yes, I killed 40,000 of the enemy in this vast battle. When the truth is the vast majority of them just got the hell out of there. Yeah. So we got this image of these battles. Now, atrocity is another whole dynamic when they're helpless and you're killing them off with selected individuals. That's mm. a different story. But in the heat of battle, when we become angry, the forebrain shuts down, the midbrain takes over, and we slam into that resistance. Mm. So... And that's definitely, and those are definitely areas that are that are you're, you're touching on so many interesting threads that I really want to unpack. But one of the things that I that I really want to ask before we get to that is I, I want to try and understand Dave Grosman a little bit, um, yeah. because you know there's this man, larger than life man, who you know has been part of my life at least since 2003 when I first read uh, On Killing. I've since read On Combat um, a number of times, but. Maybe let's start a little bit with what motivated, who were you as a young man and what motivated you initially to go to the military? What was it that drove you, uh, young Dave Grosman, to join the military? I, I had a lot of influencers in my early life. But one of the most influential authors uh, was Robert Heinlein, and especially his book, Starship Troopers. And, uh, you know, it, it, as a young infantry officer, uh, half of all infantry officers have read it. It was on uh, the force comm officers recommended reading list. And they're shoving it down the throat of the other half to make them read it. And mm. it's really a terribly influential book. And it takes this uh, individual who enlists in this elite organization and then goes to OCS and becomes an officer. And it really became kind of my, my life chart. And, uh, and, and, uh, but it started much earlier. I remember when I went to the first grade, uh, didn't go to kindergarten because school started first grade at that time in that location. Mm icebreaker teacher said, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be a soldier. You know, that's all I ever wanted to do. And, uh, and so again, you know, here I am, you know, it, you know, young soldier. I went to one of the more elite units that I could find, you know, and uh, with really kind of a minimal of knowledge and, uh, and these Vietnam veterans all around us. And we wanted to know what killing was about, what it was like. Hmm. And I think if, you know, if, if, if somebody uh, said, Hey bud, how's sex with the wife? You know, how it's been going on, you know, how often you get into it, but you, you, you blow them off, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Masters and Johnson is doing a scholarly study and they've got this survey. You might tell them. And that's really what happened. You know, a, a army ranger uh, going to be a West Point psych professor, a uh, 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 prior service buck sergeant uh, doing a scholarly research and people would talk to me. And we really found out this resistance to killing. About 15% of the riflemen would fire in World War II. Now, if a, if a leader stood over their shoulder and demanded that they'd fire, most of them would. But when the leader's gone, they'd just stop firing. They'd be brave. They'd run ammo. They'd rescue wounded. But the moment or two, they just wouldn't pull the trigger. And we see uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, hmm. where we policed up all the used up muskets at the end of Gettysburg, and the vast majority were loaded, hmm. uh, which is a valuable commodity of muzzle-loading muskets. Logically, you'd think that they'd, they'd at least take one shot and then throw it away. But And then we've got the ones that have been loaded and loaded and loaded. And you got this vision of the guy that you know, stands up there, won't pull the trigger, puts it down, loads it up, takes it up again, and again, won't pull the trigger. And we've got you know just over a dozen rounds lodged up the barrel of that weapon. And, mm. and, uh, and the truth is, with those old black powder weapons, all you got to do is just tap it off and the one round will push all the others out and you're still a functional weapon. Yeah. So this dynamic of the resistance to killing has, has been there throughout history. And, uh, but, you know, in the, uh, the American Legion magazine, oh, about a decade back, was, uh, was really offended 
by this guy saying that most of our soldiers wouldn't pull the trigger. Hmm. And they had this thing, all right, you know, if you were in war and you didn't pull the trigger, write in and tell us about it. And then poof, they never talked about it again. Uh, and I know what happened to them because I get those kind of emails all the time. People said, yeah, you know, I, I didn't pull the trigger. You know, uh, I, friends died and, and, I, and, and I didn't pull the trigger. And uh, so at the end of World War II, we knew it was an issue. And we overcame that problem by making killing a conditioned response. Hmm. Like, uh, you know, in World War II, we shot up bullseye targets. We have no known cases, any bullseyes ever attacking our troops. And, uh, and if you've been in the armed forces of any first world nation, you, you never once shot a bullseye. A man shaped silhouette pops in field of view. You hit the target, the target drops, stimulus response, stimulus response. You know, young Sergeant Grossman going to night school to get a two-year degree to go to OCS. My very first class was a Psych 101, had a great teacher. And she said, uh, you know, take something that you're learning and see how the models that you're learning apply to what you're doing in your life. And I said, well, look, at modern marksmanship is training. Military is a perfect example of operant conditioning. It was really, it was the first college paper I ever wrote. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got this, you know, we've got the reward schedule. We've got stimulus response. It's all in there. Maybe so, let's talk about that because I think that's a really important point that maybe some of my civilian listeners won't necessarily have clear context to. Uh, you made the point about, you know, it's not a bullseye, uh, and anybody that's been in any of the modern uh, armies certainly doesn't fire at a bullseye unless we're zeroing weapons. Uh, yeah. But apart from that, the uh, the target is a you know picture of a, a an image of some sort uh, or a computerized graphic uh, that we now use basically a, a an upscaled computer game, uh, which yeah. is uh, you know you can you can line up an entire section. Um, maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Why why has that? To why has that had such a profound impact and what is the impact? Because your book talks about the difference in firing uh, between, say, World War II and then uh, up to Vietnam, how drastic that difference was. Well, by, by world, you know, world War II, maybe 15% of the individual recommend, 15 to 20 would pull the trigger, uh, left to, to their own devices. By the Korean War, we got it over 50%. By Vietnam, got it 98%. But we really weren't getting the hit rate. There was a lot of spray and pray going on. The modern video simulators have brought us up to a whole new level of uh, not just shooting, but hitting the target. You know, the simulator fidelity is the, the, is the buzzword. Uh, and the more realistic the simulator, the more the transfer to reality. And, uh, you know, it, it's like video games, you know, realism is a holy grail of video games and, and, vid, you know, this fidelity is the holy grail, and they're both the same. And we talk about how the fact that the same conditioning techniques are happening in video games to children. Yeah. And yeah. it's a factor in the equation that's going on there. One of the interesting things about on killing, we talk about them, you know, I, I coined the term killology. And it's been pretty widely accepted, kind of like suicidology or sexology. Criminology is not about teaching people to be criminals. Killology is not about teaching people to kill. We're, we're really pretty good at that. It, it's understanding the factors that enable and, res, and restrain killing in society. Hmm. And, and I'll give you one example. I had an article early in the pandemic saying, basically, let's think very carefully about everybody wearing a mask. You know, they, they, uh, if, uh, if the Israeli research says that if you're kidnapped or captured and, and your, your, your captors blindfold you or put a hood over you, you're far more likely to be killed by your captors. And say, so, well, I, I can't see them. I'm not a threat to them. So I'm less likely to be killed. That's not what's keeping you alive. Hmm. What's keeping you alive is looking in the eyes of another human being and having to kill them. That's why in a, in a firing squad, we put the blindfold on them. We don't do that for him. <laughs> do you want to blindfold? No. Oh, you are so brave. But we don't care. Because yeah, we don't care. We're going to yeah. kill you. It's for those gonna, pulling the trigger. Yeah. But we can deny your humanity. Mm. So anything we can do to deny somebody's humanity increases violence. And then, you know, with the uh, the headsmen, the axemen always wore a mask. They wore a hood, you know, the, and, the, and, and it empowers anonymity, empowers violence. You know, we know people will say things online they would never say face to face. Mm. And the mask creates that same kind of anonymity. And we got to look at second and third order effects. Maybe it's worth it. Maybe it needs to be done. But let's be sure we understand the, the costs that are involved. 
Uh, when I teach my law enforcement classes, I say from your very youngest days, you saw their face and they saw your face and you smiled and they smiled. And, and, and at a gut biological level, you don't understand. They don't see your face. Mm-hmm. You, you can't communicate anymore. Everything has changed. You know, talk with your hands a lot. Do that thumbs up there. You'd be amazed. I'm in airplanes every day and we're all masked up. And I give them the thumbs up and they're just so grateful. Hmm. That somebody's broken through that barrier. You can't see their smile. You can't see their frown, but you see that head, that thumbs up. And uh, I, I think one thing coming out of this pandemic is we'll, we'll, we'll be talk with our hands a lot more. You know, hmm. fighter pilots, if you tie their hands together, they can't talk, you know. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> but yeah. Understanding how we can enable violence and restrain violence and how the mask can be, you know, it, it, it allowing the, the dehumanization of your victim, uh, uh, creating anonymity for the attacker. These are the ways killology can be applied to understand what's going on in our society. So On Killing came out, really done a lot of important things. But, you know, I thought what was at the core of combat was the act of killing. Hmm. And and I think there's a tendency to make too much of that. Um, you know, I think survivor guilt. Uh, I, I think uh, that the horrible things that you see, uh, they, they, we, we talk about moral injury, but I'm really the guy that introduced that concept. But we, we can't take that too far. The people who came home from World War II were, in general, just fine. They, they were the greatest generation. There is a capacity to be empowered by warfare, to, to come out stronger from this situation. And a sizable percentage are not, and, mm. and the price of war is very high, never be taken lightly. But in my presentations, I began to move towards a balancing act. I call no pity party, no macho man. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think combat will destroy you, then you're halfway home to being destroyed. And, and, you know, we've got a lot of myths out there. Like, you know, we we talk about uh, 22 veterans a day in America take their life. Best we can tell this true. But the word veteran is completely different than combat veteran. And in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, we drafted everybody. Elvis Presley was drafted. Elvis was a veteran. He served for two years. He got out. He was a veteran. So Mm -hmm. most of those 22 veterans a day taking their life are are 70, 80, 90 year old men. Mm -hmm. And suicide among the elderly is a totally different topic. And, And worldwide, we are facing a horrendous explosion of suicide. There is a great suicide in law enforcement and firefighters, in military. But there's also an explosion of suicide in children and normal citizens. Hmm. One of the factors. Well, what do you there, put that down to, then, Colonel? Because that's a, again, that's another area that I wanted to discuss. Um, but well, what do you put that down to? The, the, the one new factor, and do an online search for global epidemic of sleep deprivation. Hmm. Yep. And sleep deprivation, the primary impact of sleep deprivation, is impaired judgment. It makes you stupid. You do stupid stuff. And and the most stupid thing any living organism can ever do is to kill themselves. Mm. Every single living organism has a powerful drive to self-preservation. You have to have profoundly impaired judgment to kill yourself. So uh, alcohol and suicide have always been very related. Alcohol creates impaired judgment. Uh, You make a bad decision, never get a chance to rethink it. But the most pervasive form of impaired judgment worldwide is this epidemic of sleep deprivation. Sleep is a biological blind spot. Our bodies don't know how to make us get enough sleep because it always happened naturally. Hmm. It got dark every night and there was nothing to do. It was dark. You had a little talking, had a little sex, rolled over and went to sleep. Hmm. The body didn't have to make us sleep. It happened naturally. And then we invented the electric light and the television and the video game. And suddenly and we the have the smartphone. Little- yeah. Yeah. And, and we and social media and the cell phones and, and our bodies don't know how to make us get enough sleep. So it is without a doubt a key factor. And I tell people, you know, my book, Assassination Generation, is really one of my most important books. Uh, we, we had stopped teaching our kids to kill and then we we really updated it and changed the format a lot to Assassination Generation. Really mm-hmm. recommend it terribly highly. But this this dynamic of sleep deprivation is, uh, is, a, is a key factor in our teen suicides and teenagers, 10, 11, 12 year old, they call them teenagers. In America, teenage girls' suicide rate has tripled 
per capita in just the last decade. Mm. And, and I tell people, here's parenting 101 for the 21st century. When you send your kid to bed at night, take their cell phone away from them. Mm. Cell phone, no laptop, no television in the room. They have got to go to the room and sleep. In a dark and, room, preferably, right? Yeah. 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 In, 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 in a totally dark room. And that's another, I talk a lot about, about sleep hygiene. But I had a cop come up to me during a break in one of my classes. He said, uh, he said, I had a good girl. She was an A student. She said, Dad, it's embarrassing. You don't have to take my cell phone every night. You can trust me. He said, so I trust her. I let her keep her cell phone. Hmm. And she took her life. He said, my little girl took her life. And we never knew the hell she was living in until we looked at the text messages on her cell phone. Night after night of ceaseless, relentless, vicious bullying. Hmm. And he can't just ignore that stuff. We're not wired that way. He said it was heartbreaking to see her up night after night, all night long, trying to defend herself, trying to find somebody to stand up for. He said, I understood my little girl was bullied to death. Hmm. What I didn't understand until now she was sleep deprived, tormented, and bullied to death in front of my eyes, and I let it happen. He said, I can't ignore that text message in the middle of the night. How do we expect our kids to? So the, 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 the incredibly addictive video games, each generation is more immersive and more powerful. Uh, you know, I tell all you old timers, everybody remembers Tetris. Hmm. Think Tetris on steroids with crack. And each generation, more immersive. Uh, and and it, it's it's research tells us video games are responsible for at least 15 percent of all divorces in America. Spouse says, OK, decide what's important, your family or that game. That's easy. 15 percent of all divorces. Boom. And and uh, so, we, we, yeah, we, it's a we, powerful. It's a really powerful drug, I guess. Yeah. And so it is. It is. It is digital crack. Hmm. Uh, it's just addictive. You know, and, and I, I tell my cops, I tell my military, there is nothing wrong with any adult playing any game, unless it gets in the way of your sleep or your family or your life or your job. So, so you, you, it is designed to put us in a flow state, the video mm. game. Mm. Set a timer, play for an hour or two. Ding, the timer goes off. Use your steely warrior discipline, save the game and move on. Oh, oh, oh. I play a major massive metamorphic online orgasmic game. You can't do anything an hour or two a night. Okay, decide now it's important. Yeah. Is your oath as a peace officer important? Is your vow of marriage important? Is your family important? Is your job important? Is your health important? Or is the game important? Decide now. Mm. Because that game is literally important. It's cool. Quit mm. your job right now. Move into your parents' basement. Draw unemployment. Buy a giant economy-sized bag of Cheetos. Play video games all night long. Millions of people are doing that. But if you want to have a life, you want to uphold your responsibility to your family, to your job, your vow of marriage, your oath as a peace officer, you got to get those things under control. Yeah. And I, I, I tell them, look, I see it. You look at me like a deer in the headlight. Saying, oh, you're talking straight to me, dude. It's cool. You see, nobody ever told you that. But now you know. And you know damn well I'm right. You can't deny it. Mm. And we can't keep doing business that way. And, of course, the social media. The Internet never sleeps. You're up all night long on social media. You know, we, we've got cell phone calls. People who text you in the middle of the night without a damn good reason are not your friends. You know? mm. and, and so we cut this worldwide epidemic of suicides. We also have a worldwide explosion of traffic deaths. Mm. Decade after decade, we brought traffic deaths down, airbags, seatbelts, medical technology. A and then over the last decade, in virtually every nation on the planet, traffic deaths are back up again. What is the new factor? And we know sleep deprivation and alcohol are the two major factors in traffic deaths. The third major cause of death that has exploded is opiate overdoses. Well, why opiates? And prescription opiates have always been there. Why is there suddenly the demand? Sleep deprivation creates chronic pain. The tendons and muscles never just simply relax. Hmm. And the mega doses of caffeine are stopping us from getting deep cycle sleep. And again, the tendons and muscles never relax. This, this global epidemic of caffeine abuse combined with sleep deprivation is just mm. designed to create massive uh, chronic pain. Doc, I heard all the time, give me a pill to fix it. You don't need a pill. You need more sleep. And not 
the caffeine shortly after lunch that's stopping you from getting deep cycle sleep. No, that's absolutely right. And I think one of the, but well, particularly on the, on the coffee and the caffeine side of things, I mean, obviously I was a caffeine addict just like anybody who served uh, without a doubt uh, has been, particularly on deployments, that seems to be the thing that keeps you going. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've, uh, you know, for years now, as you it triggered me just when you said uh, after lunch, it was literally when I stopped because of the half-life of uh, of coffee is actually, uh, I think it's about six to eight hours. Uh, so, you know, if you, if, you, if you drink a cup of coffee at midday, you know, by the time it's uh, time to start winding down, that coffee is still half buzzing in you, uh, you know, and that's a, that's a challenge. Uh, yeah. But I've heard, the amount of times I've heard people uh, who say, oh, I can have a coffee, you know, before going to bed uh, and I'd go to sleep. I was one of those. I, yeah. I literally used to have a coffee before going to bed and I'd fall asleep. But the reality is that sleep is never, never a clean, deep sleep. Yeah. And that's, I think, yeah. the, the challenge. So, so we've got this, this new dynamic. Now, just as a side on that, you know, our armed forces in, in America, we've been at war for 20 years. Mm. And for the first 15 years, we passed out energy drinks like water. Yeah. The company yeah. gave us pallets of energy drinks. We gave them the troops. Aren't we nice guys? Yeah. And then five years ago, Two major Department of Defense-wide studies. For all practical purpose, there is a complete ban on energy drinks. Oh, okay. The, uh, yeah, they're like alcohol. You know, you're an adult. You want to buy your own. Not going to stop you, but we'll never give it to you. Hmm. In an academic environment, the one taking the most energy drinks were the ones with the worst grades. In a tactical environment, the one pounding down the most energy drinks were the ones most likely to not off in the job. All there is in that stuff is a mega dose of caffeine and some stuff to make you metabolize it quickly. It will give you a one hour burst of physical ability and then you crash before a PT test, before an athletic event, one energy drink. Not a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Give you a one hour burst and then you crash. The second one is not doing anything but building your tolerance and your addiction to caffeine. So just understand that uh, when we look at our, our suicides, uh, that so much of what's going on is, is is a broader societal dynamic. And we've got to be able to try to call out how, what are the suicides caused by war? And they are real, and it is a factor. Um, well, the other dynamic that I talk about, no pity party, is this idea that everybody has PTSD. Hmm. And, uh, and I show them the data from right off the, the VA website that about five, you know, about, about 11% of the troops who didn't, didn't deploy have PTSD. About one out of 10 of the general population, you push the right button, you'll probably get a post-traumatic response. But about 16% of the ones who did deploy have PTSD. About 5% contract post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of people Mm. have post-traumatic stress, becomes post-traumatic growth, get on with life. But we use that term, we throw that D, post-traumatic stress disorder, we throw that D in there far too lightly. Mm. So, you know, I I, I trained it at national internet, I've trained at, you know, psych conferences, and there'll always be some Brit that says, ah, oh, our troops are at 5% PTSD. Why are the Americans so much higher? They're not. But our media is invested in this attack on our veterans. You know, the, the Vietnam veterans were spit on. It really did happen. They were villains, you know, and they're baby killers fighting an evil war. Hmm. Well, now they're victims. They're damaged goods, been destroyed yeah. by war. And, and, and they're not. And, and so... You know, they, this emphasis on the negative, we got to have a balanced approach. They, war is not to be taken lightly. There is a terrible cost. And yet at the same time, keep it in perspective. No pity party, yeah. but no more than that. You know, it was, it was 20 years ago, an old uh, Miami detective came up to me and he said, Colonel, you tell these kids, don't try to be the macho man. Hmm. He said, I got in my shooting, it's eat me alive. Most cops get in a shooting, it's no big deal. But some it is. And we're there for them. He said, it was two years of hell after my police shooting. I was losing my family. I was losing my job. I was losing my mind. Finally, just before the divorce, my wife convinced me to get help. Two months later, it was all over. I could have ended it any time. He said, the docs are good and they get better every day. We're darn good at treating PTSD. So that, that balancing act, beware of that pity party, that expectation that combat will destroy you, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. But beware that macho man. If there is a problem, deal with it and have faith the help can help. So, you know, well, 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 Aristotle, right? Virtue lies at the mean of two extremes, right? Don't, oh. don't go to either of the extremes. And, and, and I think that's a, 
really powerful message and an important one in the current climate because I, I think you, you, you're, you're spot on. Um, while Australia is certainly not as uh, a vocal about our veterans and veteran suicide, we are starting a, 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 a really big investigation and, and inquiry uh, into the number of veteran suicides. Uh, and well, there's... We're deeper into those. What's we that, sorry? When we, uh, and here in the States, mm -hmm. and almost anywhere else, when we start looking deeply at those veteran suicides, we find out that sleep deprivation is part of it. I think there is something in the veteran that makes us want to escape mm. and to flee reality. So the video games, the binge watching TV, the, the, the social media all night long, I think the veteran might be especially vulnerable to that. And then that is a predisposing factor, and I think that's a that's and I think that's that that's a, I think you 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 hit the nail on the head there because it's a it's the it's almost the the gateway to a whole lot of trauma and drama that follows on the sleep yeah. deprivation because it is so easily facilitated. Uh, yeah. But it also reminds me of an, of another important point, and that is the impact of sleep. We know through research, extensive research, that sleep dep deprivation impacts our ability to make moral and ethical decisions. Yes. Yes. Which is a really important and a, and a particularly interesting topic. Uh, and I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on how that sleep deprivation, especially what you said about, you know, and, and I've seen it myself, uh, the, the energy drinks and the caffeine and living, you know, on, 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 a, on a buzz, on a high. While I was, I was, never, I was never a combat uh, soldier, I was an intelligence. Uh, so, you know, we still work really, really long hours, uh, long days, lived on caffeine, you know, lived on Red Bull. I wonder what you have to say about the impact of or the compounding impact of that sleep deprivation over time on our ability to make ethical decisions in, in war and combat. You know, one where we see that, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll move into my book on combat mm -hmm. because prior to the war, I retired and was trained in law enforcement and they're the only ones in combat every day. And I, I still am very, very much invested in this, this law enforcement community. And the elephant in the living room is sleep-deprived police officers making life and death decisions. And one of the things that I do in their class is I, I talk about the fact that without sleep, the brain reverts to a primitive pattern. The prefrontal cortex slows down. The amygdala goes into overdrive. Impulsive fight or flight becomes more likely. Healthy people's brains can mimic pathological psychiatric patterns when they're sleep-deprived. Mm. And that's huge. And then we got another, it's a, a 2017 study from a, a sheriff's department in King County, Washington State, which is a huge, huge sheriff's office. They, they found out that if an officer works four hours additional overtime in a week, uh, the, the odds that they'll discharge their firearm goes up 15%. Wow. So, so in this whole dynamic of, of what's happening in, in, in this law enforcement community, you know, truck drivers and airline pilots, I required to log enough sleep, the cops aren't. That, that should enrage us. Well, one of the things that our whole society should just be up in arms about is sleep deprived first responders. The driving vehicles at high speeds, making life and death decisions and sleep deprived. That should, that should enrage us. Mm. You know, I'm on an airplane every night and, and if they don't have a rested crew, they cancel the flight. Better no yeah. pilot than a tired pilot. Uh, in the same way, better no cop than a tired cop. It really is better to have no cop than to have somebody to walk out there and make bad decisions. And we got to, we got to embrace that. And so uh, uh, it's, it's really this, this, this challenge to our civilization. But as I said, my next book after I'm killing was on combat. And what I realized was really at the core is like auditory exclusion. You know, how in the hell could we have had 500 years of gunpowder combat and not let people know the shots get muted in combat? I mean, this is insane. The things we don't know. Um, so we, we think we're this like this, this wisest civilization that's ever existed. We send people off to war and we don't even understand what's happening. Mm. Our people to kill. We don't understand the reality of combat. The simplest little things like tunnel vision, uh, uh, slow motion time, auditory exclusion, that people want to combat not knowing. So yeah. the book on combat is what I literally wrote for my kid going into the fight. It's now in its like third or fourth edition and we're actually working on, on we got so much to add to it yeah. that I'm on, on combat volume two, which is case studies and applications. And uh, we're going some detail on that. 
But this is what people going to the fight really need. The killing is academic. It's interesting. Uh, for a tiny percentage, it's traumatic. But most people, it, 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 you know, it's, it's other factors that, yeah. that blindside. And then what happens in the event is scary. What happens after the event when you re-experience it can scare the lights out of you. But it is not PTSD. Re you know, a gunshot goes off, your heart is pounding, you're gasping for air. That's normal. It becomes PTSD when you try to not think about it. You will literally drive yourself crazy trying to not think about it. You got to make peace with the memory, separate the memory from the emotions. And one of the, the breathing exercises has always been what I've used, but in recent years, we changed it to a bottle of water. And uh, and what we have is if fight or flight and rest and digest. So uh, this uh, this dynamic of, uh, of this backlash of, of of rest and digest. If you have somebody, you know, milk it, take a knee and have a swig from your canteen. It's incredibly calming. Mm. It is. It is sending a mechanism that says we're safe. Having a drink of water calms somebody down and gives them the ability to to separate the memory from the emotion. A friend of mine is one of our nation's leading therapists for federal agents, and uh, she started using this. We. We, we interview the agent about the incident. Every time they start to become emotional, they stop and take a swig of water. And she told me, she said, she said, 14 years of practice, six years of college, and that stupid bottle of water is doing more work than I've ever done. That's yeah. not always that easy. There's more complex PTSD. There's other dynamics involved. One of the factors, though, that we come out of combat with is survivor guilt. You know, why me? Why am I alive and they're dead? And what I tell people is it's really important. Survivor guilt is not PTSD. It's grieving. It's loss. It's hard, but it's normal. Yeah. In the normal cycle of life, we will all bury our parents. Anything more normal, the parents had died before their children, but it's hard. In most people's lives, one of the hardest things you will ever do is to bury your parents. Mm. Is that PTSD? No. Does it destroy us? Well, in most cases, no. We're, we're a little bit wiser people. After we lost our parents, we know how precious every minute can be. Yeah. And would they want us to be destroyed? No. And in this violent world, is there anything more normal that some of our fellow comrades would pay the ultimate price? Hmm. Uh, would, would they want us to be destroyed? No. And and so with the survivor guilt, is something we got to pull out as a separate strand in the equation. Yeah. And the grieving process and everything goes with that. So uh, that's that's kind of the you know the on killing on combat in a nutshell. The uh... but uh, can I just take pick up on one point that you made so eloquently, and that is the inevitable fact that we are not as autonomous, not as rational, not as free thinking, free playing individuals as we think we are. So there are all of these various impacts of the sleep being one of them. We may think that. You know, when we're sleep deprived, no, I, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, I'm okay. But we also know, I think is, is it 18 hours? After 18 hours, you're basically, uh, clinically drunk, uh, yes. or, or legally, sorry, legally drunk. Uh, but also on, you know, the other impacts of the environment, the, the group, the identity that one embodies, the role that one plays, all of that has an impact on the behaviors that we then go and carry out. And I think there's a, there's a, fallacy in our minds where we think that we are autonomous rational beings who make our decisions uh, you know independent of the environment uh, any, any thoughts on that because i think you, you you've kind of touched on that in a number of different uh, areas which uh, uh, a favorite topic of mine is these, these social blind spots and uh, and you know uh, you know the auditory exclusion the resistance to killing but as you dig in deeper you know, like the, the, I, I like to use the example of the necktie. Hmm. You know, the fashions come and go over a hundred years. The necktie has been there, and it starts at your crotch. It comes up to here. It's got a big knob at the end. It, it's a dick, and and the thing of it is that it works. If you wear in your power suit with a big red power tie, and you your detective knocks on the front door, and the little monkey brain goes, ooh, 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 and it works, and, and that's why we keep doing it. And, and and women almost never wear a, a tie. If they do, it's like their waitress is demeaning. The monkey brain, women will wear anything men wear, but they won't wear a tie because the monkey brain says, oh, oh, who's that? And, and it doesn't work. And and I, people said, Dave, you're crazy. Oh, maybe, but you'll, you'll never see 
you know, a, a, a woman reach up and adjust a guy's tie in quite the same way again. You know, we, we, we're a hundred years, they were all wearing dicks. They got, mm. they got the elders of the church and the little kid getting their dicks. Wearing his red dick. They're all wearing dicks when they see it. So, uh, another social blind spot that I talk about is uh, is mowing the lawn. We have to beat our vegetation into a homogenous species. It's cut to a certain level. Well, why do we do that? You know, if we were worried about you know global warming and and greenhouse, we'd we'd have a meadow. And why don't we have a meadow in the front lawn? Why do we have to? Mow you know, I, I'm in the my lawn to, to all clover lawn. You know, my, my city wouldn't let us get away with growing a meadow in the backyard. They find you. Know, but why do we have to do that? You know, our ancestors had to cut down every tree. When when I was at West Point, there's great historical dynamic. They got Fort Putnam is halfway up on the the mountainside and interlocking fields of fire with these redoubts and uh, and and I said, well, you you took all the trees off because uh, uh, you wanted us to see it. No, no, the trees weren't there. The trees were a valuable resource. They were firewood, they were, they were, they were furniture, you know? And, and trees were where the Indians were and, and, the, and the wild creatures were. The first, the symbol of civilization was the ax. And so we would cut down all the trees and we'd leave one in the middle of the field. You ever seen that like one at a crossroads, one tree in the middle of the field? Because I suffered this one tree to live that demonstrate my mastery over nature. And then, and then about 100 years ago, we said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, we need trees. And, and here in America, we, we admitted Arbor Day. And all of a sudden, about 100 years ago, we said, no, no, we don't want to cut down every tree. That's not fair. That's really not good. That's, we, we want to plant trees. We want to grow trees. We need trees. Hmm. But you see their mindset of cutting down every tree. Well, we've taken that far further with mowing our lawn. How much pollution is created? How much chemicals do we shock that lawn with? A hundred years ago, why did they have to beat their lawn? Into, and why is there only one species of plant cut to a certain level? Hmm. It's insane. And, and my favorite example is breathing. Uh, a friend of mine wrote a book, and she, she, it's just called Breathe. And she talks about how, you know, toddlers and preschoolers have got that adorable little pot belly that hangs out there. And somewhere around five years old, we all learn the Superman pose. And we suck our gut in. And we start doing horizontal, and we start doing vertical breathing. And so we look at, I'm going to start, you know, pictures of primitive tribes. And here's the primitive tribesmen all standing there, and the guts are hanging out. You know, they got it hanging out. Oh, look at them. <laughs> they're, they're, no, we're the ones that got it wrong. They, they, they know how to breathe. We can't even breathe right. Healthy breathing is horizontal breathing. You breathe in, the belly goes out. Let that Twinkie tumor just hang out there. Huh? You breathe out, the belly relaxes. So this soup, we can't even breathe right. We're wearing dicks and we don't even see it. We, we beat our lawn into submission. We don't even see it. But, but I think the greatest, and, and I'm, I'm kind of dabbling in a book called On Depravity. I got a book coming out a year from now on hunting, and it will be the definitive book. On hunting. I had a book come out this year on spiritual combat. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my, my most successful book out of the starting blocks as far as, uh, you know, reviews and other things. But I, I dabble with the idea of a book called On Depravity. What's truly depraved? And I, I think, you know, when you look at what our society is headed towards, it I dabbled into some pretty sick stuff that I just couldn't deal with anymore. But dog sex is out there. It may become the norm. Family sex sexuality of children at a young age is done. It's a done deal. We, it's that, that's out of the bag. And and those things are kind of depraved. But the depravity that will destroy us is violence. Hmm. And, you know, sex is a healthy part of, of most people's lives. And, you know, it's up to you. If you want to you do it within limits. But, but violence has no place in most people's healthy lives. And this this obsession with with violent television and violent movies and violent video games, and most importantly of all, how we inflict it upon our children. I think in the end, when we look at all of this this lack of ability to to be self aware, the one that has the most capacity to destroy us hmm. is, is violence, and the way we glorify war, 
and the way the movies and the TV shows. I, I know when I decided to be a soldier at five years old, I know why. I, I'd seen a movie on TV called Back to Baton. It was a great World War II propaganda movie. And a little five-year-old Grossman looked at it and said, whoa, that's what I want to do. And I said, I'm going to be a soldier. Not, not necessarily a bad thing. But to have inflicted that stuff on a kid at five years old, and, and of course, this stuff today is far worse. And yeah. it's child abuse. And, and it, children, up until they're five, six, sometimes seven, eight years old, what they see on TV in the movie is the same as real life. They can't discern them. So the, your children, you know, we talk about the children of war, talk about children who see death and destruction. The truth is, physiologically speaking, the one watching a horror movie, the one watching a war movie is having the exact same physiological response to their child's body. Hmm. And when we talk about children of war, we need to understand we're creating a generation of people who are desensitized and who are, who are, who are, who are embracing uh, violence. But even more so when it, when we, we vilify law enforcement and we, hmm. and we, we, we take criminals and criminal behavior and we hold that up in a positive manner. Right up until the 1960s, Hollywood, the television industry, operated by a code. It was called the Hayes Code. And, 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 and most of this code, and Hollywood said, we know the stories we tell will have an impact on our society. Hmm. And we know we have a responsibility to tell stories that will have a positive impact. And most of the code could be said in three words. Crime doesn't pay. Uh, criminals will not be depicted in a positive manner. Law enforcement overall will not be depicted in a negative manner. Crime doesn't pay. And then in the late 1960s and getting worse and worse every decade, we turned that on its head hmm. where we glorified criminals and we vilified law enforcement. And the result is horrendous. But, but let's cut to the chase on how bad the situation really is. Mm -hmm. Another social blind spot that is terribly important. Um, medical technology hmm. is holding down the murder rate. This is so important. The number of dead people badly misrepresent the problem because the docs are saving ever more lives every year. So we had a great study that came out in the early 2000s between the 1960s, UMass Harvard study and the journal Homicide, major journal, between the 1960s and the 1990s, Medical technology cut the murder rate to a third or a quarter of what it would otherwise be. That is to compare murders in the 90s with the 60s. Mm. You have to multiply the murders in the 60s by a factor of about four. And the leaps and bounds of life-saving technology coming off the battlefield in, 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 since, the ninth, you know, since the early 2000s is astounding. Tourniquets alone, every cop is tourniquets, everybody slaps. If a cop slaps on a tourniquet, saves a crime victim's life, you're prevented to murder. Hmm. And some crime, I mean, some medical experts believe that tourniquets alone have cut the murder rate in half in America in just the last decade. So understand then that in 2020, we, we, had, the, uh, we had the George Floyd riots and the yeah. defund the police movement all the attack and the vilification of the media showing the same over and over and over again. Well, what's the result of that? Well, and, and this didn't happen and it's not the pandemic doing it because we're not seeing it in all these other nations. It was, it was these, these riots that did more harm in property value than we've ever seen in the history of our nation. You know, and notice how, when you talk about that's an inflation adjusted dollars, we talk about inflation adjusted dollars, uh, we hmm. compare the, the minimum wage from the 1960s to the 1990s without a, a lying for inflation. We're lying. And we compare the murder rate between the 90s and the 60s and don't allow for medical technology. We're lying. So just as we have, we have inflation-adjusted dollars, we need medically-adjusted murders. Hmm. And when we do that, it will transform the way we see it. Now, with that said, then, in 2020 – we had a 37% increase in homicides across America. The worst we've ever seen was a 12.5% increase one year in the 1960s. The worst mm -hmm. annual increase in homicides, 12.5% in 2020, we're looking at 37%. But it's not three times worse than the 1960s. It was 10 to 20 times worse 
And when we really begin to understand, people say, oh, the murder rate's back to 1990s level. No, it's much worse than that. It's at levels we've never seen before. It's worse than the 1960s level. And, and our denial, you know, I can tell you it in one sentence, boom, you get it. Medical technology holds down the murder rate. The number of dead people underrepresent the problem. Boom, we get it. So why doesn't our entire civilization embrace that and accurately reflect hmm. the level of violence in our society? What about Boom. violent assaults? Is that is that the same then? Because, I mean, I think it, it feels problem, to me like a, yeah. Sorry, it's go. really a temptation to use the aggravated assault rate in America yeah. or this assault rate. The problem is it's too easy to fudge that data. Where do we draw that magic line between ag assault and simple assault? Every okay. couple to We'll make, we'll make the egg assault rate say whatever you want it to say. But dead is dead. You know, murdered is murdered. Murder is, is pretty solid data. But it's flawed data unless you allow for medical technology. And then it's almost perfect as, as to reflect how bad the situation is. Everything else we can fudge the data on, mm. but dead is dead. Although there are some people fudging the data on murder. Cops tell me stories about, you know, when we reported at the national level, if for the first 24 hours, we don't know the cause of death, then it goes up to the national recording level. It's unknown cause. And one cop told me, you know, to, okay, Sarge, he's been murdered. <laughs> that We don't know. You're not the coroner. Well, he's, he's got three bullet holes in him. He's, he murdered. You don't know that. You're not the coroner. It's unknown cause of death. And so we bring our murder rate down as far as what's reported at the national level by just waiting 24 hours before we, oh, well, I guess he was murdered. And, and that murder didn't get reported. So people can play with the murder rate, but it, it's really about the best gold standard that we have. And I guess the point, the important point to make there, it doesn't even have to be intentional. You know, that, that might not be, that's just, that's a systematic requirement that, you know, a coroner needs to pronounce somebody's cause of death. Uh, so it might not be, it might not be a bad intention, somebody intentionally trying to bring the murder rate down, but the result is the same that well, you know, multiplied across the country that will have that impact. Happening at an unconscious level. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the medical technology is holding down the murder rate. Boom. Why don't we all embrace that? Why don't we all accurately reflect the situation? And it keeps coming back to these social blind spots. Mm. These things we don't want to talk about. This, these things we don't want to confront. Yeah. Uh, the, the truth of it is that it, we are just the least self-aware, least healthy civilization I think the world's ever seen. Yeah. Uh, and, and we've got this, this image of ourselves as the epitome of human achievement. Everything from the necktie to mowing the lawn to, mm. uh, to you know, not knowing the reality of combat to hiding from ourselves the reality of, uh, of crime rates. No. Uh, it, it's grim times. And that's a really nice way to, 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 to bring us back to that, to that uh, question of the impact on the environment, because I really want to hone in on that a little bit. And I, and, and I definitely don't want to come back to the, uh, the kind of virus of uh, violence as you, as you uh, refer to it. Um, what I, one of the things that I'm really grappling with to, to really contextualize and understand myself, and I've spoken about this to, to various other guests in my podcast, is how a perfectly healthy soldier who is noble, honorable, um, well-trained, ethically sound, how we see this decline, and not always, but sometimes, and we know this, you know, not even just in the recent conflicts, but we know in Vietnam how the line got blurred of what is right and what is wrong and how easily, not easily necessarily, but how, and, and, and I think, you know, I'm kidding, you talk about this one example of, uh, 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 in, about Vietnam, a, a, a person on a bike wearing the black pajamas, which were very much closely tied to the Viet Cong. And, you, you know, you kill him because, and, and the excuse was, well, I'm sure he's Viet Cong, right? Why else would he be riding away from us? Uh, and, and I think we, this is, quite relevant for us in Australia at the moment because some of our special forces soldiers are uh, uh, basically uh, accused of alleged war crimes in Afghanistan. I'm pretty sure there's uh, there's something similar in the US and the UK. Uh, and I certainly don't want to cast judgment on them. What I'm trying to do is understand how good people come to do bad things uh, and how much, that, you know, and talking about the environment, you know, how, how does that actually happen? Well, first off, I think every one of these accusations has been looked at very carefully. Uh, the, the memory distortions that come out of combat are really powerful. Uh, you know, we had a thing a while back when in Vietnam, one SEAL team in Vietnam, uh, one of the guys said, we, we've murdered this, this, this room full of, of innocent civilians. Everybody else said, 
No, he didn't. So it, is he hiding it? Uh, or or is he make is it a memory distortion? Now, I'll give you an example. It was just last week. I was training a bunch of cops, and afterwards, a cop came up to me, and he said, "I want you to understand how powerful these memory distortions can become." He said, "I shot this guy. He was three. He was charging me with a knife. He was three feet away. I knew I'd been cut. I knew I'd been cut. I kept looking at my hands to look for blood." And then, you know, you, I, I'm, I'm in the vehicle with friends going back to the station. And I said, do you see any blood? No, there's no blood there. But are, are you sure there's no blood? Yes, there's no blood there. That he believed with such intensity that he had been cut. And, and over and over again, in the face of, of no blood on his hands, he, he can't believe that. Hmm. Because that belief was so intense that even in the face of, 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 of obviously being wrong, he keeps trying to, to re-embrace that, that belief that happened in the time. So well, first off, give everybody their, their, their day in court. A hundred percent. And that was the point I was making. I certainly don't want to, that, uh, I couldn't agree more, which is why I stressed, alleged. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah. But the truth is we know it can happen. Hmm. And, and I think the best model I have is that model from on killing, hmm. of the killing enabling factors. You know, we have Mi Lai, the massacre that happened in Vietnam was this great example. We've got a, a unit that's been in combat continuously, so they're horrendously sleep deprived. And that's one of the predisposing factors. They had a, a beloved sergeant who had just recently been killed in combat, another predisposing factor. They got a leader demanding that they commit this crime. They've got group dynamics in which all of them together, you know, it, you know, it, it, the reason why we have a lot of people in a firing squad there's this diffusion of responsibility in this. Uh, and, and then we've got this, this, this dynamic of dehumanizing the enemy. And, and the, you've got almost a perfect dynamic in which all of the factors come into play. And, and it's so important in warfare that we overcome that. And really, in, it, it, after Vietnam, the United States Armed Forces became the first armed forces in history, without a doubt. And now we see it pretty much worldwide where we taught our soldiers how to disobey an illegal order. I mean, telling soldiers to disobey, <laughs> you know, teaching them to disobey. You know, in 1974, you know, Private Grossman in basic training, uh, you know, we had a, a film, you know, and that's an illegal order and you must not follow that order. And if, mm. if the chain of command won't deal with it, then go to the chaplain. And, and, we, and, and it's, what a revolution on the battlefield. Yeah, and the truth is that we uh, we fought this war uh, with with less atrocities and less uh, less of these these kind of things than ever before in history. We we've, we've been so careful about collateral damage, and and uh, and yet it still happens, and it's hard. Again, the things that hard for soldiers to live with is not killing and not necessarily uh, the survivor guilt, hmm. but that that person that that got in the way and and was the child that was killed by accident or the yeah. child that, you know, that the enemy, you know, shoved at us to create a situation which you had to make the decision. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and I just want to capitalize on that point because I think, uh, and just to be explicitly clear, my, my, my stance on this is, uh, and I think you've just captured it right, quite neatly. I, I think we fall for the trap and we often use the term a few bad apples uh, you know, the few bad apples that have uh, gotten rotten uh, and have steered away. But, and, and what you just said as well is arguably it's if, if all the conditions are right, if all the con conditions are met, it's inevitable. And this is the whole piece about us not being these glorious, autonomous, free thinking, free willing beings. We are, we are an animal that is absolutely programmable as the point you're making with all of the training that we go through we are programming our soldiers to become far better at that is a that is a that is a stimulus response as you as you rightly point out close the loop on that uh, yeah. it's important for your listeners to understand that you know well when, when you become frightened the forebrain shuts down the midbrain mm. takes over and that's where that resistance to killing comes in but the way we make frightened people do what we want them to do is operant conditioning you know, a kid in a fire drill, a pilot in a flight simulator, uh, you know, the, the space shuttle goes down into their last second. They're doing drills that they've been drilled to and things they're trying to do to fix the problem. And, air, you know, a, a, a pilot's going down, an airplane full of people, is, a jetliner's going down, 
And that pilot is is just is scared out of the wits. They're going to die. There's no doubt about it. And yet, to the last second, they're in the process of trying different possibilities. They don't. They don't. You know that that pilot has been drilled, drilled, drilled on emergency responses. They don't panic. It's up. They don't run away. They just keep going. That's the power of our condition stimulus response. We, we've turned the modern military into the condition response. And, and that becomes the new dynamic situation. Thanks for that. I think that all speaks uh, a lot to, to how I perceive the world as well. But I really do want to, and, and, and conscious of your time, we'll maybe start uh, wrapping it up. But I really do want to take us out on this uh, key message that you have, and that is this vi- virus of violent crime uh, that we're seeing through violent games. Um, and one of the things that uh, is, is particularly I think the U.S. is a particular case study, and I think you're quite vocal about that. So maybe I'll, I'll just hand over to you and, and, and maybe give me your thoughts on, on where we are at the moment and what is the threat uh, and what are the dangers. Well, you know, uh, uh, we, we've talked about the fact that the murder rate is being held down by medical technology. and Why we got mm. that down? Uh, when we get an accurate reflection of how bad it is, it, 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 it's mind-boggling. But it's even worse than that. You know, the DSM, the Bible of Psychiatry and Psychology on PTSD, says whenever the cause of your trauma is human in nature, the degree of trauma is usually more severe and long-lasting. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people die of natural causes every day, you know, disease and heart disease. People die every day. But one serial killer, one serial rapist can paralyze a city. You know, the, the, mm. the Port Darwin massacre in Australia transformed the way a nation operated. You know, that same day, thousands of Australians died from natural causes that didn't change their behavior. You know, traffic accidents, they're accidents. They don't change their behavior. Uh, on 9-11, 3,000 citizens were murdered. We, we went to war. Our way of life changed forever. That same year, more than 30,000 people were killed by traffic accidents. Didn't change nothing. Mm. So understand that when a human being when it's violent interpersonal human aggression, it, it is the most psychologically corrosive thing anyone will ever face. Mm. Uh, and, and that's what we're looking at. It's this virus of violence, this explosion of violence. I, I cover it really in my book, Assassination Generation, which I, I, I think is terribly important to understand the, the magnitude of the threat. And then, of course, in 2020 and 2021, things have come completely unglued in America uh, that the annual homicide rate increased 10, 20 times worse than anything we have ever seen before. Wow. And it keeps coming back to that whole dynamic of, uh, of, of, of the, you know, in the end, the depravity that society can't live with. Uh, in the end, the this, this self-delusion that is most capacity to destroy us is our failure to come to terms with the sick stuff we're feeding our children and, and the predisposing factors to violence and the trauma that were inflicted upon our children at a young age. And, and I'm desperately, we've got to get that one under control. We can keep wearing our ties and mowing our lawn, but the one craziness that we just can't sustain that, that, is, that is dooming our civilization is our failure to accurately understand how bad the situation is and the mm. harm that's been done by feeding this stuff to our children. The same operant conditioning that we give military and law enforcement is being done to children yeah. without the safeguard of discipline. And that, that, should, that should enrage us. And one of the things that I can't uh, uh, not ask, uh, because uh, you've been quite vocal on this as well, uh, and, and this is maybe my own cultural programming here, so, so maybe just help me understand. F- for us in Australia, it is it is th- the link between homicide rates, particularly in the US, which is you know we also know in Australia is 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 among it's certainly amongst the highest in the developed OECD countries, um, maybe not necessarily in the world because there are places that are far higher than the US, but for us, the natural link is there's so many guns in the U.S., so therefore, if the environment is such that, you know, children are programmed uh, or desensitized to violence and then there's accessibility to uh, weapons, to, to, to us, it seems like there's a natural correlation between, you know, the availability of guns, the programming that occurs, and then, of course, the resultant violence. But I don't think – where do you sit on that? Just maybe, maybe I won't put words in your mouth. You know, we, um, we've got Mexico right south of us there, and- it's really valuable to go to Wikipedia and look at world homicide rates. Mm. And there's a list of every nation on the planet. And click on the rate and click it again, get the worst ones on top. And look at the most 30 most violent nations on the planet. And with the exception of Brazil and South Africa, uh, 
uh, which have limited gun rights. Every single one of those nations have got unarmed citizens. Now, how, how are those gun laws working out for Mexico? You know, how's that, how's that working out for Colombia or Guatemala? You know, how's all that working out? The, the truth is that uh, when we say, well, uh, you know, America has the highest murder rate of any developed nation, what they do is they take that list and anything with a higher homicide rate than us, they take it off the list and then they say, these are the developed nations. Uh, it, when you dig into that, it, it's far more complex than that. And, and again, quite frankly, uh, across the, the, a third, I recently heard the figure, and I think it's probably accurate, a third of all the, the homicides in the world are occurring in Latin America and South America. Hmm. And, uh, and almost, again, with, with very few exceptions, maybe, maybe Brazil, where they have limited gun rights, you've got these, these gun laws. You know, how's that working out for those nations? It's more complex than that. The dynamic of being able to protect yourself is a critical part of it. Around the world, if you're a politician, if you're wealthy, you have armed security. But the peasants and the peons will never have the same right. Now, I am my family's secret service. I'm very well trained. It's my hobby. It's my sport. And, uh, I am my family's secret service. And we're, uh, we're not peasants and peons who've been robbed of our ability to protect ourselves. And uh, as has happened in Mexico or, or all of Latin America and, and across vast chunks of the world. And again, we look at nations like uh, like Russia, semi-totalitarian nation, uh, and yet Russia's had juvenile mass murders in the school. Russia's had their own college massacre in the Crimea with, uh, with 20 dead and 50 wounded. Now, we look at China, the one nation in the world that's probably succeeded in confiscating all guns. And we see daycare maskers and kindergarten maskers with axes, hatchets, knives, and, you know, uh, swords, a guy with a hammer and a daycare hammering the, their skulls in one by one. We, we get report after report of mass murders in China being done with knives. So we, we really is great value in, in I said, it's, it's not about what's in their hand. Hmm. It's about what's in their head. Yeah, and and and, and I, Dave, I, I couldn't agree more. And again, again, that speaks to that environment, right? The, uh, any kind of weapon is merely a means to an end uh, that is already motivated by something else. Uh, and I think that's the, the. I think that's a. If I'm understanding you correctly, then I, I think that's a really, really important point. Uh, that you know, it could be a whole range of factors, just like we talked about the soldiers. It could be a range of factors that bring a person to that one point where violence through whatever means, whether it's the, uh, a pistol, uh, uh, an assault rifle, a knife, or, 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 or just a, a pole, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's going to be the, the motivations behind it to drive it. It is so easy to look at just one factor and think that's going to solve it all. Hmm. Part of what's going on here is the, you know, the, the media will never point the finger back at themselves. They'll never admit that there's any harm done. I mean, they, the commercials are worth vast amounts of money because yeah. they influence behavior but they accept no responsibility of what's in between the commercials. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so uh, uh, they've got to point the finger somewhere else. Mm. And it, it really is easy to point it to some inanimate object and, and, and claim that that's what's responsible for it. And if we just get rid of all those guns, does it all go away? So we've, uh, you know, we've, we've got the, a, a complex dynamic going on. But in America... We believe, and I, I think you, you I, I hope I'm wrong, but as we see things coming unglued around the world, and we may say a time in Australia once say, wait a minute, you know, why are we punishing law abiding citizens when criminals continue? You know, an, an island nation uh, which has complete control of their borders uh, might be able to do this, hmm. but uh, our nation with, uh, with 3,000 miles of border with Mexico and uh, uh, you know, in, in very, very porous uh, coasts uh, as far as being able to get around the border and bring things in. Uh, we, we can't stop uh, millions yeah. of tons of marijuana and, and, and cocaine and fentanyl coming in the nation. And all of a sudden we can't stop. We can't stop millions of illegal aliens, mm -hmm. but we're going to wave a magic wand and stop all the guns. Yeah. No, I think that's it, which is why I, I completely empathize with your perspective. I think the reality for the U.S. is such that, uh, yeah, if you asked all the law-abiding citizens to hand their guns back, they might, but what about all the non-law-abiding uh, you know, criminals, etc.? They certainly won't hand their guns back. So you are therefore uh, uh, disempowering the population. Uh, and I think in, in another point in the U.S. is, of course, is the the pressure on the police. You know, we're hearing even whispers of it here, but the whole idea of defund the police and uh, 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 to remove, you know, 
particular yep. particular holds and and so on from the police to basically uh, cut, cut those that are protecting the population off at their feet. Uh, I think it's also uh, playing a part, and and I think you, you're right. It's partially that narrative uh, of media uh, and the competing narratives uh, that exist as well. Now, of all the topics we could look at, you are focusing like a laser beam on the most important topic in the world today. We, like I said, we, we can live with a variety of depraved and crazy dynamics in our society, but this is the one that will destroy us. This is the one that we need to get right. You know, I always try to take time in, in every podcast. You know, when I was a kid, we grew up, we had uh, three TV networks, one, maybe two newspapers in every every city, and, and a couple of national magazines, maybe half a dozen. And if you didn't get on that limited handful of, of media outlets, your voice would never be heard. Hmm. But today, we have this this breakthrough of information. We have the podcast revolution, which I think is one of the most profound and positive dynamics in our civilization. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I commend you for just dedication to looking deeper into this topic, and I commend your listeners for seeking more information than a three-minute soundbite. Hmm. Uh, I, I think that represents one of the most hopeful dynamics in the midst of all the other insanity uh, there are some positive things that are happening, and this is one of them. And uh, hats off to you, and I wish you the very best in your future endeavors in this direction, Les. Colonel, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Take care, God bless. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Voices of War. You can access all episodes on www.thevoicesofwar.com or by subscribing wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And while you're there, please give us a review as we'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the show, you can reach me on info at thevoicesofwar.com.